what's up everybody? This is Susanna and welcome to the Codeco podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here's the show. Thanks. This is the Codeco podcast. Welcome to episode four for season one. This episode was recorded on Wednesday the 9th of November 2022 for release on Thursday the 15th of December 2022. This episode is sponsored by Split.io. I am your host, Drew Freeman, and always with our awesome co-host, Susanna Skyer-Gupta. Thanks, Drew. In this episode, we're going to visit with friend of the show, Mark Dalrymple, a longtime industry expert, a veteran of AOL and of Google, and author of the Advanced Mac OS X Programming Guide through Big Nerd Ranch. Mark's also a co-founder of Cocoa Heads, the international Mac and iOS programmers group. Mark, welcome back to the show. It's good to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me back. It's like, hey, what show is this we've done? Is like second or third one? Fourth. This is fourth because I listened to all three of the others, <laughs> which are fabulous. Yes, when Susanna wow, researches, flies. Susanna researches. You, you just have to be ready for that. <laughs> so, wow. so uh, normally I start with non-tech with people, but you, we always have a little bit of show and tell. And you told me this just before the show. We are both connoisseurs of of old Mac and Apple books. And and you just picked up a pair? Yes. Yeah, a friend of mine from AOL is moving to Costa Rica and is jettisoning and all his old books. had this picture of all these books on his floor, like old Inside Macintoshes, the newer Inside Macintoshes. And there were two (laughs) which I just, just had to pick up. I already had the Scott Canaster um, debugging Macintosh software, but there's this uh, object-oriented programming for the Macintosh, Object Pascal, Mac app, as well as like a survey of existing... Look at the sweet Mac on the cover. Oh, man, yes. It's like when nerds ruled the world. Oh, my goodness. It's like a comb-over before the hair starts to go. (laughs) (laughs) But the dude wrote some really good books. I I learned a lot of this first time around. And then the other one is the the Max Bug reference and debugging guide. She even it has was a such cool a shame when bug with Max bomb. Bug went away. Yeah. If I was I, actually if more I, of a Jazzix debugger guy. But if I remember correctly, Max Bug was something that was actually in the Apple and then made its way across to Mac. Yeah, I think it originally came from Motorola. So I think that's where the M came from. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was Motorola Assembler something, some yeah. But because uh, I remember at uh, at WWDC when they used to do Stump the Experts, somebody was asked what the oldest copyrighted software, uh, the oldest software on the Mac was, and the Mac team were all like, "Well, it has to be something from eighty from eighty four, and it turns out it was Mac bugs from eighty one. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, stump the so that did stump the experts. Things. Yeah. It's always fun to watch them go looking up through all of their, their material and everything. So, Mark, let's let's take our hands off the keyboard and talk oh. about what, what have you been doing for fun when you're not attached to, to coding and keyboarding and all of that? <laughs> oh, geez. Well, some of my fun is more coding and, and keyboarding. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple side project apps in the store, uh, one of which is is Music Jot, uh, music notation for the iPad, which we've been developing for 14 years now, I think. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, and music and Jot is of... amazing with what, what kind of stuff it can do. Yeah, 14 years. And it's a cool story of a professional programmer, amateur musician, and my other half is a professional musician, amateur programmer, and our skills happen mm. to mesh really well and we've gotten to be really good friends over the 14 years we've been working on this yeah i was uh watching you demonstrate that at a recent coco heads and well you demonstrated at many of the coco heads but but some of the newer stuff that you throw in where 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 things just line up you you put a half note in and other things immediately jump over and move to where they're supposed to be yeah i think you were demonstrating uh the chord trees and how they arrange the notes on the tree and putting in accidental so the more accidentals you have in a close 
compact chord, they have to lay out in this particular way so that they don't overlap each other. So you end up having like, you know, either in one column, but if they overlap, then one has to overflow to another column. If you have enough, then it can you can have three columns of these accidentals that have to be arranged just so. And that's just like one tiny aspect of music notation, which is huge, deep, and arbitrary. So and what other you can kind of uh, see that got a music stand back there? So yeah, yes, you, know, you do. Yeah, I, I I play trombone in uh, community bands and swing bands, and I play bassoon in the local orchestras. Nice. So, so, do you find yourself so fourteen years of developing that? How much refactoring have you done recently? Like, did you turn it all into Swift UI? I th I'm doubting <laughs> yes, but. Oh no, it's it's actually all still Objective C because my over, my other half uh, is is a C programmer. He did C mm -hmm. on PCs back in the day, and he understands Objective C, and it's big, but it compiles quickly, which Swift oh, tends good. to not tend to not do. And actually, not too much of our user interface is like would benefit from Swift UI because the biggest thing is the main canvas where you have all the music stuff. And that is custom events, custom event handling, a bunch of gesture recognizers, and quartz drawing. So each note head is a character from a font, and we draw the stems, we draw the beaming. Um, Swift UI, last time I looked, was not great for that kind of software. Yeah. Yeah, I found the Swift UI. Well, it does have canvas drawing now. It's still, I think, in its, in, in its earlier stages. Um, I don't know. I, I've tried to start playing with canvas drawing, but I find myself going, no, I'm going to go run back to, to <laughs> other languages where I feel safe. Yeah, we have done kind of refactorings to um, sometimes it's to work around bad bugs and sometimes to improve our user interface. My, my most, I think, impressive one was uh, before. So everything is inside of a scrolling um, canvas and we originally had okay our score view it would draw the canvas you could draw around and it could cache things for you and everything is great but as we soon discovered that as your score got larger that the view got larger and is backed by a graphic card texture and once you get beyond a certain size then the texture fails the layer is oh, wow. not handling things correctly and you crash so we'd have users that mm. got to like 50 measures is great i had the 51st measure and you crash and mm. the way we worked around that was, okay, instead of sc scrolling the score view around, we now scroll just an empty UI view. And that means that there's no backing store because there's no custom stuff. And we put our gesture mm. recognizers and buttons and whatnot on that. And then there's the actual score view, which doesn't scroll, sits behind the scroll view and only draws what is inside of its portal. So we detect when things have scrolled and say, ah, okay, redraw this chunk of measures actually some on either side so you can get like uh, you know, slurs and other stuff to to render correctly and but we're always now drawing just what's inside of this little viewport uh thereby <laughs> not dying when our users actually use the program yeah it's caching complexity is always one of those things that catches up with you eventually and it's one of those where you just kind of find out where all the coordinate tendrils are, because instead of having a, this touch is this position in the score, it's now this touch is this position in the screen. So we have like score coordinates and then our virtual coordinates and our screen coordinates that we have to make sure jive when we're laying things out, handling user events, uh, you no, know, even printing. We ran into some, some issues where we had coordinate transfers bad when we were laying stuff out on a page. But that that's software. It's why you make the big buck. <laughs> the big yeah, buck. I'm... Singular. <laughs> <laughs> so now you said you were doing a couple of uh, side things. Are there any ones you can talk about? Yeah, the other one is through a uh, group uh, called iClass Builder. It is a uh, an app for indoor cycling instructors. So spinning instructors. Um, they can go to the website um, create classes, um, like here's a playlist of music. Um, I want to do specific queuing, like I'm going to do a two by 20 power test. And I want to coach the people through this, have RPM suggestions and uh, heart zones. We, we work with the Sally Edwards and the, the heart zones company. Um, and 
they design this class, cool. And then I'm part, I write the iOS app where they go to the club, um, pull down their class, and then either Spotify, Apple Music, or they can provide their own music through Dropbox, can then play the class, plug the music into the speakers, airplay a ride profile up on the screen so that people who are in the class can see, oh, cool, here's the two by 20. We're going to have, okay, a couple minutes break between the two parts of the, the power test. And then also badges at the top. So they can see, okay, it should be this RPM or this heart zone. And the instructor also has a dashboard of the current queue, the upcoming queue. They've got a lap counter and they can see how much time is left in the current song and the current class. Um, and our users love it. For those of you who are listening on the podcast, in a few weeks we're going to have this on YouTube. And I really bring this out because Mark is very expressive when he talks, and you actually get more of what he's saying by watching some of the <laughs> gestures that he makes. Um, <laughs> So how'd you get into that? Like, are you, do you do spin <laughs> classes? Are you into spin? Oh, um, it's, everything is a story. So shortly before I left Google, um, the uh, Charlotte, my wife and I, we were like, we, we, I want to get back into bicycling because I did bicycling for a lot of the nineties and no spinning. I've heard spinning is cool. So Charlotte did some, some research and found this spinning studio called Global Ride in Lower Burrow, Pennsylvania. So I live near Leechburg, Pennsylvania, and I don't mind being doxxed. All my information is already out there anyway, um, near Leechburg. So Lower Burrow is not that much bigger than Leechburg. It's like these small towns. It's like, why would this have a spinning studio? Okay, cool. It got pretty good reviews. So I went over there, met the owner, Gene Macy, and he had this like really cool like upstairs room with 20 bikes and a stereo system and fans. And he also offered yoga and Pilates. And we were like, yes. Well, it turned out that Global Ride, oh, and also um, he made cycling DVDs. He would fly to Hawaii, strap oh, cameras cool. to cars and have bring some bicyclists and follow the bicyclists through routes and then edit those and add music and coaching. So you could exercise to you know, riding through roads in Hawaii. Um, it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. Well, it turns out all this was an incubation. He, he's kind of like a, a, a laboratory for his um, you know, experimental you know, guinea pigs. And you know, sometimes we make guinea pig noises during classes, like, ee, 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 Gene's doing something to us. Um, <laughs> but after he had a double hip replacement, he was uh, had a recommendation of using spinning as a form of uh, therapy. And he went okay. to a spinning class. And it was a terrible experience. It was a Barbies on bikes. Like, okay, we're just starting. Go full out, up, down, up, down, up, down. Pull up the weights. And he was like, this is bad. And so he was like, okay, I'm going to approach this scientifically. Reach out to people who kind of teach indoor cycling, like regular just cycling on the road. And that's how he built his classes. Um, and eventually um, created a power training program for folks who are not like top gear athletes because the Kaiser bikes we had inside had power meters. And so you could use that. And so if you could uh, sustain one watt per pound, uh, you could climb most of the hills in Western Pennsylvania. It's hilly around here. And he ran experiments and did the science to verify that stuff. And he's got a power training book in the iBook store, if anybody wants to, to check it out. And when I was like on my way out of Google, he was like, I'm going to move the studio and do this more seriously, like you know, record training classes, make certifications. I thought, I'm going to be out of a job soon. Hey, do you want a partner? Want to do stuff? And And he was like, sure. And since then it's been like about maybe 12 years we've now been working on these things various versions um the 32-bit apocalypse actually killed our previous version of the app because of spotify and some video mm. stuff that you're doing with in-app purchases which we don't do anymore um so pretty much a ground up rewrite in swift so that's kind of like my swift swift playground so oh that's cool and do you still do spin go ahead Unfortunately, no. Uh, Gino, as he likes to be called, um, moved farther down into the city. And we found another gym around here with uh, spinning classes, and they were not good. So kind of like, yeah, we've got we've got a bike upstairs and we've got a bunch of stuff on video that we we use when it's outside of cycling season. So you've you've made a very successful process of transitioning from I have work 
do I have new work? <laughs> you, you're very, very innovative at, at, at finding these, these new opportunities. It's having friends and having the, it's having friends and the inability to say no. Mm -hmm. Because both of these projects I thought would be, okay, it will be kind of entertaining for a while and then they're going to lose interest. They're going to move on to something else. But no, I didn't realize just how laser focused uh, John on Music Jot and Gino and iClass Builder were. So that's how I'm still here today. So I, I think it might be an interesting exploration or discussion because I know that there are several software engineers that are likely to be without jobs over the past week, next week, as Absolutely. we hear things from uh, some, a couple of small companies uh, like Twitter and Facebook. Any yeah, lip unfortunately, books? Go ahead. Yeah, for, yeah, unfortunately, neither of these pay very well. I don't think I've broken minimum wage on Music Chat. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they've been a lot of fun and I've learned a lot. So the so the, the the projects that are out there that that you can find again you are not necessarily getting into hard software engineering positions where they're paying you software engineering salaries. Right. Yeah, and but it can be a good with... thing I think to do in between. You know, like it depends on what stage you feel you're at. at in your career, maybe this is, you know, maybe this works now because you're not in between. You're like, okay, I have other income and I can do this, but you know, it could be a good thing for somebody from Twitter or Meta or Stripe or Lyft or, oh my gosh, guys, the yeah. list is getting long. Well, I survived the, the, um, dot com implosion in 2001. So it's working for a, um, actually a quintessential dot com excess story uh, not success story but excess story where one of the quotes out of a history of uh, ars digita was like why don't we just burn cash 24 7 in a golden trash can um so <laughs> so ars digita uh had had the the bloodbath on october 11th 2001 so one month after october 11th uh, september 11th um and I got four months six, uh, of like wrapping up project work and then it was like, bye. And that, that was a very interesting time. Similarly, a lot of folks were hitting the market. Um, luckily I've always kept like six months of living expenses in something liquid so that if I did lose my job, I could go for six months, you no know, tighten your belts, go for nine months of being able to like, take a reasoned approach to what is the next stage. I didn't mm -hmm. have to take the next visual basic job that floated by so that I could feed the cat and keep a roof over my head. Now that's right. a luxury. A lot of folks don't have particularly like the student loan debt that, so this happened my 10th year into my career. Um, so I managed to have enough of a nest egg. And it was during that downtime where I took my first big nerd ranch class. I changed my focus from Unix networking websites to OS 10 graphic programming and no, that was oh, wow. a so huge career change. So was that change. your start with Apple, really? Like the world of Apple? No, actually Apple II in uh, junior high and high school, Macintosh through then. And typically it was either Mac programming, like old school pre OS 10 Mac, which I did at mm -hmm. AOL or Unix stuff, which I did at the two parts on, on either either side os 10 was kind of unique that it was mac stuff unix stuff which i knew and also next step which i had always always right. just just absolutely wanted a next cube when it first came out and byte magazine had uh, you know, essentially it was hardware pornography about the, the next of like here's all the cool stuff <laughs> it does and here's all the amazing all the things you can get to it it's like this is amazing i want one and i managed to secure the cash to buy one uh, they were expensive um, but oh, yeah. they would not sell it to me because they only sold to educational uh, educational institutions and hendrix college in conway arkansas where i went was not one of their 
you know, highly influential institutions that they wanted to get these machines into. And somewhere in my files, I still have my rejection letter from the developer program. But I still, oh, wow. <laughs> I still went and bought the documentation. It was like four linear feet of these white volumes. Like, this is really cool. A lot of square brackets and stuff. I don't understand, but this is pretty cool. Okay. And then OS X. So like when Next purchased Apple for like negative $300 million or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then OS X was like, hey, here's Next Step with a old school a blue box old Mac sidecar is like next step Unix Mac stuff. It's like, yes, this is my next kind of like, you know, almost ideal direction that, that my career could have gone into. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to see a next cube at Carnegie Mellon, um, when they had one there, but the, uh, seeing one up close did not have quite the, allure as having read the programming stuff underneath everything that was going on there it was a a seemingly clunky interface at the time actually i got to see one um late yeah late 80s so uh my dad in addition to being radiology and nuclear medicine was also a member of the arkansas symphony um so he's a french horn and trombone player and at the major university in Conway, University of Central Arkansas, they actually had some interest from the next folk and a next person was giving a demonstration to the music department. And so- uh, Oh, wow. The, so, and the one of the instructors over there is a trombone player that knew my dad, who knew my interest in next. And so he basically called me up as like, hey, Mark, the guy is bringing an X cube over. Do you want to come play with it? I'm like, yes, uh, you won't sell it to me, <laughs> but I can still use it. And so compared to like, you know, the black and white Mac SE, which I had, I think I had maybe a access to a Mac 2 with a 640 by 480 screen, seeing that absolutely gigantic screen, like you know, a million pixels on it, not quite a million, but it was close. And four colors, it was like shading, this is cool. Um, and like bringing up a dictionary with pictures in it. You know, the works of Shakespeare, you could search through mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, um, it was running off the Magneto optical drive, so uh, it wasn't slow. It was majestic, but it was still like <laughs> you could see the potential of like this is hardcore tech and also kind of loving polish for ordinary people using it. If I remember correctly, the the price tag was somewhere around sixty five or seven sixty five hundred seven thousand, wasn't it? Uh, was it grand. that much? Was it okay. ten? It was. Yeah, was, yeah, the initial ones was 10 grand out of the box. Wow. Right. And then eventually they stopped with the hardware, but continued with the software. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think op Next Step begat OpenStep, and it ran on a bunch of Unix systems. So you could get this next runtime for a Solaris, HPUX, um, and I think they still sold Next Step as a bootable PC operating system. Yeah, yeah I remember because when uh, when Open Step was uh, when Next Step was first debuted as part of the 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 OS X dream, they basically said, "So here's Next Step. Go out and get yourself a PC." And this was a <laughs> WWDC. They're actually telling all these Apple developers, "Go out and get a PC and install this PC software and and have fun." And uh, I, I remember that was that was quite the uh, the process. I remember telling my boss I wanted a PC, and he looked at me like, "You've never wanted a PC. You're always that <laughs> Mac guy here." But, uh, and and so began that piece of history. So, where did you transition into Big Nerd Ranch? Where how did that occur? Um, I've been in the Big Nerd Ranch orbit for well over twenty years now. Um, actually, I ended up writing a uh, the 20th anniversary history and gave a presentation of it at a webinar for folks at the 20th anniversary. Um, so basically, it was my job, job at Ars Digita went away. I knew I wanted to get into this new Mac thing. Like, okay, I want to learn stuff. And remember magazines? Like these printed... <laughs> Those yeah. things you got every month that were printed on paper. They had words on it you could read, code you could type in. And then in the back, they had these advertisements, you know, targeted advertisements because they knew that you were 
buying Mac Tech magazine that you're interested in technical Mac stuff. And I, there, they had this like quarter page ad in the back of Big Nerd Ranch, come learn to program the new Macs. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like Big Nerd Ranch. That is such a delightfully weird name. Um, went to their website, saw the course, um, and it's like, this is absolutely perfect for me. You know, a week, intensive study. Um, I knew to which book to buy. So actually I worked through the book before going to, to the class um, and just really hit it off. Now, was going, this also back in the day, did you go to a class? Like you took your body and physically went out of your home? It, I, I know it's, it's really strange to think about, but I actually flew from, at the time I was living in Pennsylvania, down to um, North Carolina, uh, Asheville, yeah, Asheville, North Carolina, to Wild Acres, the uh, facility out there. And they had like enough roomage for, I think, a dozen folk. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there were tables, and Aaron supplied uh, Mac cubes. So the they were like quiet, no fans, very, very monastic environment. And the food was great. And because everything was you know, so outside fun. the travel to get there, everything was, was included. So you fed and ate in the, the place, you learned in the place, afternoon walks, and you were encouraged to get a lot of sleep because sleep helps cement the learning. And hit things off with, with Aaron. It's like, hey, he's a really cool, smart guy. I love these books. I started doing some consulting and he actually helped me get my first position um, actually with Nomos in Cranberry. Wonderful. They're no, no longer around, um, but he introduced me to them. And then I pitched an idea to him of like, hey, what about a book or a course of like programming tools, like profilers and whatnot? And he said, I can't really sell that, but I get a bunch of questions about make files and sockets and file descriptors and that kind of stuff. And it's like, I know that stuff. And so we worked together over the course of six or nine months building the core Mac OS X and Unix programming class, which then evolved into the advanced uh, Mac OS X programming Big Nerd Ranch Guide, which is the third edition. And I taught that in you know, North Carolina, Salt Lake City, in Germany. Um, and then he helped me get into Google through a good recommendation. And then once I was done with Google and did my Cycling Fusion work, it ran out of health insurance. God bless America. It's like I need, I need an employer which can supply me health insurance. Yeah. And thanks to like some, at that time it still had the um, pre-existing condition stuff going on, and so for both of us to get on the same um, same program was just not going to be affordable so it's like hey aaron are you hiring can i work and he said sure so that was 2012 so i've actually been an employee of the big nerd ranch since 2012 so that's like uh 11 years something like that um doing and uh working Almost. on books yeah yeah working so, on books teaching classes and doing client work as well what year did you uh did you take the class it was march of 2002 so yeah, I took mine about that time as well, um, and it was it was a it was a, a a hunting lodge retreat, was was where the class was, and the the, the cubes all sharing one internet line. That's <laughs> uh, where I learned to love sweet tea. I never <laughs> developed a taste for that. Oh, tea that says mmm chewy. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I, the Big Nerd Ranch, uh, the symbol at the time, I, I don't know if it still is, was the, uh, the cowboy hat with the propeller beanie. That looks kind of like, uh, like a dune buggy. So cowboy hat, which kind of curly cues around at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Oh, and is see, he... I was looking at and thinking it's like a cowboy hat with the infinity symbol as the bottom. Yeah, yeah, kind of the same thing. So is, is it more polished and more... more corporate because you know the times they change yeah i remember we were thinking uh way back when of having both aaron and ray on the show together to talk about different views on the educational process in the in the industry but at that point aaron had basically stepped back and it, it that that was sort of our the crux of our show hmm. yeah aaron actually recently posted hit the new thing that he's he's working on continua.org i'll 
put it in the Zoom hmm. chat. It basically it looks like big nerd ranch style materials, but for teaching STEM topics. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, yeah, because Aaron I think now has a PhD in like mathematics, and he's always had an interest in helping entire like categories of, of, of people that do not have the resources of things they that they need like before he was really interested in water and toilets for places that don't have those and now he's been is like concentrating on folks who really could use good materials for learning the physics and the mathematics and basic programming necessary for being a you know, non-software engineer um and making that uh, we'll definitely really, put this in the really show valuable. notes because i'm just having a look right now and a free long-term self-paced course for future engineers so that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. um so something that i know you guys are doing over there now that is really intriguing to me is that you offer an apprenticeship program and i don't know like i don't know how that works how many slots there are the way i know is because i follow a quite young gal on Twitter and she is in that program and it's been transformative for, for her because she comes from a very much a non-traditional background for an iOS dev. So mm -hmm. what do you know about that? Like how does it work and when do you guys start offering it and how can we okay. convince more companies to offer it or <laughs> should we not do that? Oh, it's definitely a great thing. So I know exactly who, who you're talking about, Via Fairchild. Um, so she has a number of mentors. So I'm not her full-time um, guiding mentor, but I'm she's not. I'm not her full-time guiding mentor, but I'm there for. Hey, I have this question. I got an explanation, but I don't understand it, because most of my explanations kind of devolve down into this thing is actually a chunk of bytes. So this language construct is not a chunk of bytes. So when you're dealing with a chunk of bytes, that's when you can call functions on it, that kind of stuff. Um, but also, um, she shadows me on my client work, uh, attending standups, um, like technical sync meetings. And also, if I've got something simple that I can slice off, I can give it to her and she can work on it with, with support. Uh, and she actually has one um, code change merged to this client project, and we're going to work on the pull request for a second one. So she's actually going to have code in a product that you can download from, from the App Store. But... No, fundamentally, the apprentice program is, is, is an altruistic effort. Like we want to you know, provide more opportunities for the non-traditional engineers. So like we got plenty computer science degree and three years of professional experience folks out there. And it's great. We need a bunch of those folks. But that's like a limited slice of the human pie. So having folks from non-traditional right. backgrounds. Uh, they bring just amazing questions, amazing insights. You may have things that you think are absolutely sacred, um, but then they ask a question of like, well, no, you really don't have to do it that way. Or machines are fast enough. You can use a winery algorithm instead of a binary search just because stuff is is so fast. Um, that's also why I've been enjoying being involved with the Underdog Devs, which is a program mm. to, uh, for a, a teaching um, programming skills for the disadvantaged and uh, uh, formerly incarcerated. Um, they, the ones who are in the program, are very intense, very smart, very, you know, question everything. And sometimes it was described as teaching a dolphin to swim is like you just kind of get in the right direction and, and they go. And so ha knowing that being able to pull those people into the software engineering um, career, I think, helps all of us. And so Big Nerd Ranch uh, specifically um, is by bringing on these less experienced engineers who have not had the uh, opportunity of a college degree where a huge amount is done, of programming is done just as part of the coursework, is you know, they need to come in with a certain set of skills, but then our job as mentors is to help bring them along until they can basically become billable as a as a, a become billable as a junior developer mm -hmm. and then from that point on they're doing real client work real interactions with other engineers with clients with still the supporting infrastructure of the rest of the nerds and also it's like great for the company because it helps us as a company improve our 
internal programs and processes so that we can like support just more people inside of our organization. And the mentoring is something that like advanced nerds who um, like are doing the hard work, you know, really intense work on client projects. Sometimes they want a more human touch or maybe they're doing work, which is like not necessarily not challenging, but they know that, you know, I could be doing more. Well, you could be doing your, you know, the work that the client needs now and also mentoring this uh, junior individual to help them grow. And I have found that like pair programming with my other half on music job is, and we actually pair every week for two hours. We've been doing that for 14 years. Um, and so, oh, he cool. ask, and he'll ask questions of like, why are you using a set here? And then I have to stop and like, okay, I did this by reflex. What was the reflex that led to this? And it's like, right. Oh, why am okay. I doing this? Yeah. Right. Because, because oh, I want uniqueness or I want fast lookup or it's just something that I do. We could put it in an array. Oh, if we put it in an array and kept it sorted, then we could have this other thing. Cool. And sometimes the question will make me rethink my process and maybe take it off in a better direction. And there are a lot of things that as engineers, we do by, by habit. I, I really do like that question, that, that sense of questioning, why am I doing this? Is this the correct solution? Because as you mentioned, um, you can find that in analyzing yourself, you find extensibility you wouldn't have others otherwise seen. Yeah, and that's why I love things like meetups, uh, Cocoa Heads especially, of like, I love it when the junior people give presentations. So um, mm. we've got, so uh, Drew may know of uh, 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 Spencer Greenholt, the, the older of, of the two Greenhold boys. Um, he is, is absolutely brilliant. He is a C programmer. He has written extensions to explain um, and as working as a security expert. When he was like early teenagers, he gave a brief demonstration of Google SketchUp to Cocoa Heads. It was his first public speaking and first kind of interaction with in public with nerds. And I, I like to think that that was kind of help him got on that trajectory of pursuing a, a, a career and lifestyle uh, in tech and now he's landing planes in some of the most frightening <laughs> we were talking about this airport um which is in oshkosh yes where oshkosh. they basically fly as many planes in as they can over a period of i think it's 48 hours Mm -hmm. And they do it one weekend with flight simulators, and then they do it the following weekend real. And This is the Oshkosh Air Show? Is that what you're talking about? No, this is not an air show. This is literally planes are flying in and out of the airport nonstop. They're actually... Oh, really? Um, hundreds, if I remember correctly. Because they yes. do an air show up there, too. Yes, the uh, fly-in and convention, like 600,000 huh. people and 10,000 airplanes every July. And oh, that's wild. And um, and what's the, the elder boy's name again? Uh, Spencer. Spencer. Spencer does this on Flight Simulator. He knows some of the flight, uh, some of the, 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 the traffic control folks. Um, he was demonstrating some of his landings and some of the uh, less careful flyers around him. So he's just just an amazing, amazing kid. And where does Spencer fit into the um, the ecosystem here? Oh, he's uh, he's a member oh. of our local Cocoa Heads, and he's somebody who started uh, giving presentations very young and oh, cool. uh, has really grown. That's neat to see. Yeah, we... COVID is beginning to fade. It would be nice to see people being to build back up into Cocoa Heads, but uh, a lot of that, as uh, Mark and I were discussing, seems to be uh, fading onto Slack and Discord channels rather than people going and doing this in, in person. And I, I I think that's a loss because that, that, that is really it's a great chance to speak, to, to, uh, to be networking with people in person like that. I 
mean, I think you still build skills if you're doing a presentation digitally. It's just different. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, so in your local Cocoa Heads group, are you back in person? Do you have regular physical meetups? Yes, there's a, uh, we use the back meeting room of a restaurant chain called Eaton Park in the area. And they have a, a server that takes care of us and they have a decent salad bar and we've got uh, <laughs> a lot of space back there. And I've got a projector actually it belongs to my wife, but she lets me borrow it uh, every month. And uh, so usually we've got like four five, six, seven, like eight hardcore regulars and then three oh, or other, good. other folks that, uh, that's, that swing through. Mm -hmm. And you go to the same one, right? That's how you guys know yeah, each other. That this yeah. is for uh, the Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh yeah. metropolitan area. Yeah. So uh, possibly how... later this season, we're going to talk a little bit more about how does one get a successful meetup off the ground. But that's really more in this post. I don't like the term post COVID, but uh, post lockdown world of yeah. you know where it's going to be either primarily online or hybrid so let's go back into tech things mark <laughs> we, we, we we talked about the fact that you had a little bit of uh apple you had a little bit of mac you had a little bit of unix how much of the unix are you still using oh all the time so i've all the time. So folks who are regulars at my Cocoa Heads know that I have a kind of a hate, hate relationship with Xcode. And so I don't spend a huge amount of time in Xcode outside of the times where I have to be there. So I actually use a old school Unix text editor called Emacs that runs in the Ooh. terminal. You can run it in Windows, but I just run it in no terminal mode. Um, what's awesome is that you can warm it up with your usual working set of files and then you never have to quit it it never crashes you don't have to restart it because it lost its mind so i've had emacs and you're contrasting running. it to something there i feel like well there's oh, emacs and there's vi and uh, never the twin oh, shall meet the, okay so oh. i'm so i actually am also an old unix person and um so i'm familiar with vi mm. so i was team vi sorry to oh. say Oh, um, I, I have no problem I, with old school editors. Now, if you wrangle one of those, you are a number one in my book. I was teasing that he was contrasting it with Xcode that has to <laughs> constantly be restarted. And yes, I, well, actually, for my current client work, I usually restart Xcode at least four or five times a day because mm -hmm. it just loses its mind, particularly with uh, the set of packages that it has. You have to quit it and do a bunch of command line shenanigans and then restart Xcode. Otherwise, it just won't build. Hashtag There's some... we love you, Xcode. <laughs> I-L-Y-X-C. <laughs> Actually, that's my shell uh, alias for nuking my derived data. So I type, I, -L no, I love you, Xcode, I-L-Y-X-C, return, and then my derived data is gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I do a lot of stuff with it. So um, Xcode's like project search is, is, is okay. It's pretty decent, but I like using a command line search utility. I use one called ag but it's kind of a rip rep style of tool which can search a directory hierarchy for something really 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 fast so i could like at the top of music jot oh ag score view i want to see wherever i have a variable named score view and a quarter of a second later i've got a bunch of output that then i can go back and and look for um Find is a fantastic utility and it's really complicated the first time you see a find command um find dot dash name star dot h dash exec uh grep os 9.1 open curly close curly backslash semicolon dash print run that but that command will only look in your header files and look at the header files to see if it contains a particular symbol and if it does we'll print out the match of the symbol and print out the name of the of the file or i could have it just print out the name of the file I could use XARGs to then feed that into another program, like say WC, which will count lines. So I could see how many lines of code are involved with files that have um, 
an availability macro relating to OS 10, 10, 13. And... See, I, I spoiled myself. I got BB Edit a long time ago, and <laughs> I like BB Edit's multi file find, and I like its mm. uh, and its grep. I love. Yeah, BB Edit is an amazing, amazing piece of software, and I'm friends with uh, with the with the primary developer. Um, nice. We're on random slack channel and he actually sent me this really nice gift box of like rhode island foodstuffs uh, like coffee like i mentioned i never heard of coffee syrup before that's apparently a staple up there and he said oh okay cool and he sent me this gift box which had the coffee syrup some candies this like special lemonade mix which they have up there and i was like hey man this is amazing thank you um, is the but great software great still, people is it is it still um uh rich yeah, Rich, Rich, yeah. Uh, Rich uh, Siegel. Siegel. Yeah, Rich Siegel's been, God, Rich Siegel's been on that since the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I used that years ago, but never like, never as a power user. And then for some reason at Codeco, we seem to really like Sublime. And that's another one where I feel like I've never, I haven't yet mastered it, you know. But um, one thing we'll do in the show notes is I'm hoping... I get this done that we can put like a couple cookbooky things like what you just sh shared with us, Mark. Yeah. You know, here's what you can. Here's how you do it. Copy Man and paint. find. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Man find. Uh, actually, come uh, back later. <laughs> <laughs> actually, at the talk that I gave at Dot Swift a couple of years ago, um, it was back before back when the Swift compiler we had at annotations was a fixed set in the compiler. And so my talk was basically, don't fear the compiler. You can check out the source code. Um, and we actually used find to find the um, implementation of at application. So if, like you have this at application attribute, it's going to generate a main. And we used find, and I had like this big slide with the final command after building it up over a bunch of slides to get to that exact piece of the compiler and like, hey, look, you can squint your eyes and see that there's a main and is doing UI application main and other stuff inside of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to uh, to do a talk on, you know, laying out the syntactic sugar. Mm -hmm. You know, taking what what is easily there, but, you know, trying to explain, well, what's actually going on behind the scenes when you do that? Because a lot of people just take it for granted. They don't actually think, you know, they, they don't actually care what is going on in the background. They just are happy that it works. Um, yeah, so. I, I believe that kind of like you've got your area of expertise. This is the thing that you're most interested in. And for me, it's application programming um, and performance. And then you're, you're pretty familiar with the levels above and below you and then less, and then eventually get to here be dragons. So like my here be dragons is CSS on the top and actual, any kind of hardware at the bottom. Uh, and other folks, their range is just, just higher. So they're like, right. no, they don't care about you no know, performance because things are so fast these days, you don't need it. And compiler optimization is so amazing. You don't have to worry the sweat the details so much. Um, and so it's kind of like, oh, compiler, it just magically does stuff. I don't care because my interest is is higher, you know, interested in document architecture and animations rather than networking kind of stuff. I think that's something that is challenging for a new person in the field to get comfortable with is like, where is it okay to say here be dragons? Like how much of this vast spectrum of computing do I personally as a new dev need to know? Because it certainly seems when um, you talk to people who are going through the interview process that it's like everything, every single thing you have to know, and it's going to be on your interview and, you know, and it's in leap code. <laughs> if you don't do well, it will you suck. I kind of view it like a balloon. Start with just the, the, the bare central and then blow that thing up as you're more comfortable. Um, you know, find, find your layer that you're working on and work across just learn those basics and essentials, and then that will steer you toward other things that you'll find that'll take your interest. And eventually you'll hit a wall and go, no, I don't want to go any further than that. 
I'm one of those people who, who I would love to learn electrical engineering, but I'm still one of those people who thinks that you hit a P and the little P gnome runs from the keyboard and paints a P on the screen. <laughs> and as a programmer, my job is to be the guy who gets the P gnome stone so that I press the P button. He runs through my computer program and gets very stoned and draws a square on the screen instead. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent description of the entire profession, ready for people to use during their interviews. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's the stoned gnome theory of computation. Um, <laughs> that's one, Thank you that's for one thing that I've <laughs> you, you got to have a good name for everything. Um, that's one thing that I really actually have benefited a lot from these side projects that actually have customers and you know, owners that direct kind of the direction that it goes in, that it has forced me out of kind of like my main comfort zone into like you know, graphics and animation and, you know, and broadening it because like I play music. I have no idea of the details of music layout and doing stuff with the app store. Like ordinarily I would, I'd, shove all the app store interaction stuff to somebody else on you know, client projects if I can. But in this case, it was like, it's me. I'm going to do it because I can understand this documentation. And John is not at, at kind of the, you know, mm -hmm. I guess, computational sophistication to work with such an API. Uh, no, 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 no uh, insult intended. Just kind of like we each have our, each have our, our strengths. Um, and so I've been hitting a, a printing too. I ordinarily would not do printing, but now I have had to figure out printing and making PDFs. And so that has forced me into like expanding my horizons and realizing, like, okay, this isn't too bad. Or yeah, this actually is really terrible. I don't want to go back there. But having yeah. experienced it, now I can make better decisions in the future. Working on a side project where you are one or one of two developers really forces you to not be able to pass the buck. It, it really says, okay, if I want this feature, if I want this functionality... There's no one else. I'm going to have to be the one to learn it. Right. Um, having done the App Store stuff and having learned how to convert uh, a UI view into a share screen graphic. Mm -hmm. These are just things that I, I wanted to avoid myself and, and, and had to learn. So we're, we're talking about different things we're learning, and I know that you're currently looking into data-oriented programming. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Just to help people who don't know, how do you capsulize <laughs> data-oriented programming? Data-oriented programming is, oh, it's one of those things where I'm just now getting into it and kind of have vague notions, but the idea is instead of objects, so having objects referring to other objects and using um, polymorphism and encapsulated state and all that kind of stuff to represent your object graph, essentially you have an in-memory relational database where you have a table of particular attributes that an object can have, and then maybe another table which adds additional attributes on that object, and it's a join which kind of makes it, oh, this object is this thing and that thing. So it kind of all goes back to um, memory access efficiency. So the data-oriented design, actually I've got the book here and I'm sure that we'll have a link to it, um, is a very interesting book. I'm in my second pass through it. Um, and it kind of starts off with a screed against object-oriented programming because it is very memory cache unfriendly. So mm. you've got your processor, and you've got your RAM. When the processor wants a piece of memory, first it says like, okay, I need this value. Are you in the level one cache? Okay, cool, I got it from there. Okay, it's not there. Are you in the level two cache? Okay, is it there? Okay, level three cache? Okay, if it's not there, then it has to actually go out to memory to get it, which takes a long, long time to do. And so the machinery then doesn't just give you back a single byte it's going to give you back a cache line of like maybe 32 bytes or 64 bytes or something like that um of like here's the byte and here's all the bytes adjacent because that's the level of granularity that it uses and now the processor can like okay cool i can get this next byte and use it and if the next byte that you need to use is like adjacent it's like 
I don't have to go to memory. I just go to level one cache. I've got the cache line right here. I can just kind of like nom, nom, nom my way through it and be done with it. Where with typical object-oriented stuff, you have an object here and an object over there. So you get a property like a Boolean from one object. You have that round trip to memory if you're not lucky enough to have it in cache. Then the next object to get its Boolean, you've got that round trip and have to come back. What if to do your processing of these objects, all you needed were a couple of Booleans and a couple of ints? If you could smash those together in a table, you can just chew through those as fast as the processor can go without having to go out and access memory in a random uh, oriented way. So data, data oriented design kind of takes a step back from object oriented programming. And unfortunately, a lot of the community there is like exceedingly anti OO because there's like screeds in here of like how terrible object oriented programming is. It's like, for what it does, it's really great. But one of the points that they bring up is that like you know, a player object in a game is going to have like a bunch of attributes, like its position. Um, does it have the ring of Gondor? Does it have this? Does it have that? So you've got a pretty good chunk of data. And if you're only interested in a little slice of it, you're going to have to pull in a whole bunch of data when you're accessing mm -hmm. a bunch of these different objects. But by having a table of has the ring of Gondor, which just has an entry of the ID of the character that currently has the ring. It doesn't have to chew through all the objects. It can just look at this table and say, oh, it's right there. Or say the map of you know, the adjacent matrix of a dungeon. If it's all there in one place, you can make very fast tests of are these rooms connected? Like you're doing like a flood fill of what textures do I need to load for where the player is going to go next? It's all right there. The, the contiguous cache lines, you can rapidly get that data, rapidly process it without having to worry about things they don't care about, which are going to be dragged along with objects. So and have you started playing with this stuff in, you know, you're using examples from games. Have you started trying it? And are you seeing the promise of much faster performance bear out? Like, can you see the difference? Not yet. I'm still like really early in on this. So I've, I watched the conference talks second time through this book. So the first time through was, okay, that's interesting. Oh, that's really neat. Um, like there was a example of a binary search, but instead of just a pure binary search, it was essentially instead of like object granularity it was cache line granularity. So it'd be like, go get the middle cache line, the linear probe through that, and then decide which one you get. And it was like several times faster than just a traditional binary search, which was like, wow, that's really neat. So I'm currently rereading it. I'm on chapter four. That algorithm is on chapter six. So my plan is to, once I hit that, is to is to try it out. Like, you know, try it out in the C++ that's in the book. I want to see how Swift does that, both uh, debug and non-debug, um, because there's also, this kind of gets into like, it's heavily C++, and then there's kind of like the whole C++ optimizations with undefined behavior and how that can affect optimizations. That's part of another book that I've been reading and having a whole lot of fun with. But to try those algorithms, both on an Intel Mac, an M1, and of course on the Playdate to see how, how a smaller, more primitive device, you know, how big are its cache lines? Does it have the same kind of you know, potential improvements that the big, highly parallel processors that we have? You may want okay, to explain thank you for the, that beautiful segue. You may want to explain <laughs> what the Playdate is. Yes. <laughs> oh, the Playdate, I've got it right here. Sorry, people in uh, audio land. Um, the Playdate is made by Panic. If you remember them, um, they produce amazing Mac software. Um, and they also have published some games like um, Firewatch and Untitled Goose Game. And a bunch of years ago, they wanted to have a special thing for their 20th anniversary. Um, I think they now are doing their 25th anniversary because it took a while to ship this thing of an actual game console that... Um, monochrome screen, 32-bit uh, so process. Cute. It has a crank. It has a crank on it. Oh, I love this. A deep D-pad, uh, two two buttons. It's got a Guys, menu possibly button. Possibly everyone's getting these uh, for Hanukkah. This is adorable. Yep. And, and it's programmable. They've got a very rich SDK, um, uh, both Lua and C. So I've been doing the C stuff just because that's... That, that, that's that's what I do, and so um, so I haven't actually finished any games yet, but I have 
So Drew may remember this. I did, you had an Apple II, right? Mm -hmm. um, the old Star Trek game. So I'm mm -hmm. starting to port it. And so you can, like, here's <laughs> the the universe. And it's like you're moving around. It can do the, hey, here's the, uh, the different quadrants that you're in. Um, and then playing with, uh, like, overlays for doing different stuff with the, um, you know, access the computer, targeting weapons, that kind of kind of thing. So taking this moldy old Apple integer basic game, have you ever tried to reverse engineer basic code? I've got the code and it's just like, this is no minds who could do this is just amazing. It's like go-tos everywhere and um, nothing is, is documented. Uh, it's glorious. Yeah, oh, but the play date is, you know, it's a 32 bit arm processor. I think it's a single core, 16 megabytes of memory which compared to the original Mac is like so much room for activities and a monochrome screen that is essentially write only memory. It's like a, um, almost like uh, e ink. So if you wanted to pull, plot a pixel on a screen, you write a set of bits to a particular address, you know, line up your bits and say, this is for row 12. And then it's going to ship that row of bytes off to the display to update. So you can update any rows that you wanted to, or update the entire screen if you want, uh, as you wish. Um, it's uh, just a really, really neat little platform. So in just having a very, very quick peek at their website, so there's a developer community. Are you involved in that? Are you on any like discussion groups? What's the community like? Um, it's very nice, very sharing, very supportive. So there are forums, official panic forums. There's an official panic discord, and then there's an unofficial discord. Um, and programming talk happens on all of them. End user talk happens on, on all of them. And there's a lot of, hey, I just made my first game. It's on itch.io, this. And everyone's like, oh, this is amazing. Thank you. Um, and what's really nice is that a lot of developers are actually charging money for their games, like one or two or three dollars. It's like not not much, but you can you know being able to kind of foster a healthy economic e ecosystem at the beginning of the platform, I think, is going to be great so that folks who do the more sophisticated games, like there's a third party game called Bloom, which is a cross between um, a life simulator and where you do all your interactions with other characters through text messages and Stardew Valley growing vegetables. Um, mm. Very, very well done. And I think they charge like 10 bucks for it. And it's like, this is totally worth you know, $10 worth of entertainment out of it. Yeah. No ads, no buy fifth, no spend $3 to get 15 crystals so that you can then play for an extra half hour. Right, right. Good. Okay, that sounds fun and fascinating, and uh, this will be our longest show notes ever, certainly <laughs> this season, because we're early in the season, but yeah. possibly ever. The, the um, audio portion of the SDK is absolutely ludicrous. So you read down the, the docs, it's like, oh, yeah, drawing, cool, you can do rectangles and blend modes and whatnot, and oh, file systems, you can open and close and read a file, oh, wow. And then you get to the audio things, like, oh, you can load a sample, and then you realize that it essentially has everything you need to make a sophisticated uh, audio workstation inside of it because it has synthesizers, it has samplers, various kinds of samplers, it has effects. So you could have several samplers going into a mixer with reverb and a compressor and various kinds of filters and everything has multiple levels of stuff. And I'm wondering just like, why? Why? <laughs> but it's also amazing because one of my hobbies is making bad electronic music. And so I'm very familiar with you know, a sawtooth versus a square wave versus a, a pulse and you know, what poles on a filter are and what a compressor does and, and, and. So it's kind of like, all right, if I knew that I wanted to shape my sound in this case, like you've got music and then you close a door. And so you want the music to kind of be filtered. Well, you can have a high pass and low pass filter on it, uh, put on a bit crusher. And then it's kind of like they've closed the door and have muted the, muted the music without having to do all that yourself. Nice. So I like that it's tiny and you turn a crank. This is it's so fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, it, it's surprisingly, um, robust because it, it it weighs a, a decent amount and be sure to get get the, the the case makes it easier for folks with bigger hands to hold and plus mm. just 
It can't be purple and yellow. It is just a great color combination. Super cute. So let's uh let's let's take one last dive into uh into the future. We've got we we're, we're at that halfway point. We've just launched all of uh Apple's toys from last year. Mhm. And we're about 6 months off of uh WWDC, I guess 7 months. Anything that really interests you possibly in the pipeline that, that you could imagine or is there any technology that came out this year that really got your interest? No, not really. I've I'm like I'm satisfied. The the stuff that I have works mostly works well. Hopefully it'll continue working and not kind of bit rot when other stuff is is put on top of it. Um, and plus with all my work, my client work and music jot and my class builder is that only using the latest and greatest operating system is not an option is that mm -hmm. we are going to support people two versions, three versions back. And for my current client work, which is a huge amount of fun, um, which I, interestingly enough is another fitness app. Um, oh, they cool. actually just recently did the crunch the numbers and said, okay, you can now support have iOS 13 as your baseline. Mm. So finally, okay. like we could we could use Swift UI one. We could use we can use Combine, which is great. Um, we can also use a compositional layout. A lot of good quality of life stuff in iOS 13, but we can't really use the new hotness from 14, 15, or 16 yeah. until until we. That's can a really good stuff. reality check as to what really people are using as working devs right now. So no, 13 it's... is a little extreme. Usually it's it's a N minus one or N minus two. So 16 is current, then you support 15. If you're really generous, you go back to 14. But this particular group has got you know, a lot of users, a lot of user, users that pay money. And so it's like, That's okay, it. can we make money or keep the developers happier? And you now it's kind of like, well, you need the money. Developers need money. <laughs> so it, we'll do it that. seems like the larger the company, the the longer you want to support your uh, your users uh just because it's like you're 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 counting beans at that point it's it's like i i've got people who are still not updating from this device and <laughs> i don't want to cut them off and it also depends on the sector because i worked for many many years in ed tech and uh when you're supporting things that live inside classrooms that's you know it's it's older stuff, so you have to support older OSs. Oh, um, even some startups. I did a, a, some work a couple of years ago with a new online streaming platform. So it's kind of like Twitch, but with almost no latency in the chat. So you had really fast communication with, with the streamer. And so this is a small platform, small number of users, but it was a, you know, can we support, I drop iOS 11 support and only support 12. But because of their monetization system, they had core group of users on 11 that were still contributing a you know, sizable amount of money to the bottom line, mm. which for, for a startup was like, you know, it wasn't quite make or break money, but it was like, if we lose that income, then they're going to have to make it up somewhere else. Mm. So do you want to weigh in on the uh, beloved question on iOS Twitter of should I, as a new dev be learning Swift UI or should I be, <laughs> using um the more traditional layout methods um it depends on UI kit. where you want to go so if you're interested in startups starting your own company kind of thing or it's a new side project and you're going to be the lone developer or a small team swift ui is definitely the way to go it's you know, the new hotness there's a whole lot of support and education around it um very very fast very easy to get beautiful results mm -hmm. um but if you think that you're going to be going into older companies or you're going to go into like contracting, um, consulting, then you're going to go into situations where you know, you're going to have a UI kit, mainly UI kit, maybe a little bit of Swift UI on top. And it was a very interesting situation with, uh, with our apprentice, if uh, I can tell the story, is that she actually did boot camps and learned Swift UI as her first programming experience, which is like, the hardest thing that I have with Swift UI is the data flow because I'm used mm -hmm. to Mongo have data, Mongo stick data into a label to get it display. 
this whole, I'm a label. I'm going to pull in the data when I need it. And if something changes over here, magically, I know to pull in the data. Yeah, again. I know to redraw. Yeah. And update the label. And I haven't had to use Swift UI in a client project, so I haven't learned it yet. So I haven't internalized how stuff works. So I've learned that stuff three or four times, but I forget it because I never use it. But but via coming into it is like, okay, yay, apprentice, this is great. You want to shadow somebody on a project? Hey, Mark D, you're 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 up. It's like it's UI kit, and there's no Swift UI here, and it was like, oh, and via is the absolute definition of grit because she's like, okay, cool, I'm going to learn UI kit. And so she's been no addition to just like learning basic programming and software engineering skills of kind of unlearning the Swift UI way, learning kind of the more primitive, but also more like tactile, the more specific mm -hmm. uh, UI kit way. So like the Swift UI is like something, add a bunch of views on it and yay, it's done. Where with UI kit, it's like, okay, we create this thing up here and we stick it in the UI layout over here and auto layout constraints. And then we update the constraints. Oh, and then we update the contents of the thing in different parts of the program, um, which was a really big, really tough thing to do. So if you're coming out of the gate, like all I know is Swift UI, but I want to go into contracting with big old companies, your brain's going to hurt for a while. So in that case, maybe UI kit would be a great place to start. Uh, so weasel out of it, like it, it depends. Um, a whole lot on kind of like what where you see yourself in the next six months next year i don't think i'm i'm tipping the vessel of knowledge here anywhere but i would say the bigger and the older a company is don't be surprised to find objective c sitting there in a lot of the right days because mm -hmm. it worked and there's so much to it why why refactor when you've got all other functionality you need to add in so so yeah it really is, if you want to be a rounded iOS engineer, you want to have a grounding in Objective-C, in, in uh, Swift, and Swift UI. And sometimes that just might not be possible, depending on the, how much time you have to, to, in, to invest it. Yeah, of all those, I'd probably put Objective-C at the bottom of the list, mainly because, like with... UI kit and you know, Swift UI, at least you're you're in one language. And if you're just learning stuff, one language is plenty. And Swift is gigantic. It is a big monster yeah. uh, with a lot lot of subtlety involved, particularly with with enums, because uh, there's like some cool stuff, but it can get kind of kind of kind of fiddly. Um, and then to throw Objective C on top of that with its completely different uh, mindset. Um, so I kind of look at Objective-C as a job security for folks like me. Um, Interesting. I can, okay. I can go go to a code base because Music Jot is all Objective-C. Um, and my Cycling Fusion stuff is all Swift. So I've got like real good experience in both of them. So if I need to go into Objective-C, debug something, um, I can. And there's some times where just like the old, you know, old folks, we have knowledge that even younger folks with Objective-C comfort don't know. Like for prior client project, they had, um, so you can have a set of Objective-C bit flags, which turn into a Swift option set. Mm -hmm. So you can like have the flags and they're the bit positions. And the this engineer had added a new flag and it just wasn't working. It just wasn't working, wasn't working and couldn't figure out why. Um, <laughs> hey, we, we can con and bow this thing. See, see if you can figure it out. Um, it turned out it was the, 32nd, no, it was a 30, yeah, the, she added the 32nd bit flag to this thing. Uh, which basically overran the number of bit flags you could have. I was going to say, so it fell off the end. No, even worse. Um, so it was a 64-bit value. And so when, but okay, so that the constant in C is 32 bits. The value, the space is going into a 64 bits, and the behavior there is to sign extend. So when they added that 30 second bit or bit number 31, uh, when they set it, that actually the constant was 32 bit. The compiler said, "Okay, I have this 32 bit value. I don't know where it came from. It has a one in the high position. That's the sign bit. I'm just going to extend it." And then suddenly, all of the upper flags of the 64 bit word are now set and not clear. And so it's, it's like this thing just isn't, isn't working. Cause actually I think it ended up like they had that 
yeah, 30 seconds adding the 33rd and it was getting clobbered by that sign extension. And so, and it was like, oh, okay, how many of these do we have? Weird behavior and no print hex and print binary and LLDB. It's like, oh, stick an L after every one of the constants and the problem went away. And so, so you threw another turp and I'm going to have to tag you on it. <laughs> You see, I get to play stupid here and ask the questions like, so you, you said you got to do a con and bal on it. Yes. Uh, there was a, um, so remember back in the days where there were magazines and Apple actually produced a developer magazine called Develop. Mm -hmm. It was Develop, right? It was beautiful. It was like a coffee table book magazine. But the last two pages of it were the con and bal, K-O-N-B-A-L which were the initials of a couple of Apple engineers, and they would have a puzzler. So kind of like Car Talk would have a puzzler at the end of each episode. This was a programming puzzler. And usually it, some of it required like in-depth knowledge that maybe only Apple had of what the problem was. And so they would describe the problem at a high level and then kind of have a back and forth conversational thing talking about the problem and things that they tried and values that they saw. And the game was that and how short of a time can you figure out what it is before they get to the problem? Because sometimes it could be, it's like, oh yeah, the the trap that got patched in latest Mac OSs changed numbers and was using a stale one or a handle got dereferenced and then floated away or like really deep assembly language register level stuff that uh, that was involved. I miss A-traps. It was a lot of fun. I miss A-traps. Uh, Crap patching for fun and profit. Yeah, now we swizzle. <laughs> I can't do that in Swift. Nope. So I'm going to bring up one last topic because I've got it on my notes here. And it says balloon animals. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, so back in the 80s when I was growing up in Little Rock, Arkansas, there was this bookstore called Publisher's Bookshop. And it was big and they had everything science fiction like the first dungeons and dragons books they had and i just love i could walk there so i'd walk there and browse the shelves and one day i saw this little book it's like a garfield book uh make balloon animals and it had a little hand pump and a dozen animal balloons in it it's like seems weird cool so got it and just kind of fell in love with it so through high school, college, uh, just like balloon animals or something. I just like sit down, I can make a dog, a poodle, teddy bear. Um, and then I discovered balloon mailing lists, um, balloon communities, and like getting you know, educational VHS tapes, and DVDs, <laughs> and doing things like balloonicature. So you can like use multiple balloons and make a person's face. You could make a frog pull out the tongue and it snaps back. So some, you get some pretty sophisticated stuff out of it. Uh, even went to a balloon convention. So that was a very bizarre, strange, and fun experience. But with the balloons, I've managed to work those into my professional life as well. So in my resume, I have proficient balloon twister at the bottom of it. Just kind of like <laughs> all this stuff and just proficient balloon twister just there. And sometimes I see if nobody notices it. I'm so, glad I'm not the only one. At the bottom of mine, at the bottom of my resume, it says references and bad impressions at by request. Bad nice. vocal impressions by request. <laughs> Whenever somebody asks me that in an interview, I'm like, okay, you have my attention. You read my resume all the way through. So I interviewed at Google. The very first interviewer was like, hey, I saw this balloon animal thing on your on, on, on your, your resume. Can you make me one? And I came prepared because I traveled with, with a baggie of balloons. Like, <laughs> sure. I love it. What what would you like? Um, and 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 Greg and I we became fast friends after after this. But he was like caught off guard of like, oh, you're actually prepared. I wasn't expecting this. Uh, a UML diagram. <laughs> so, <laughs> and for folks who don't know, a UML diagram is basically like you no know, objects and relationships. It's it's squares with arrows. So it was like, oh, that's easy. I push. All right. So so here's a balloon. No, so so no. The the square is a class. So I can have dotted lines for abstract classes. Squeaky squeaky. And I made a square out of it. It's like here's your class, and whoosh, and the arrow shows relationships. And I made an arrow and attached it to the square. And he's like, okay, okay, I get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we have Mark on the show. Yeah, I, I, so I think this is in a nutshell why we have Mark on the show. 
This oh. just makes me want to get together in real life because I oh. want to say ludicrous things and then see their balloon representation. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it's also a great kind of, pro- no, it's been a professional icebreaker. So it, at Google, it was tradition that if you go visited another office for a period of time that you would give a tech talk of, oh, here's a technology I'm working on. Let's share kumbaya, all that kind of stuff. And my sister lives in Seattle and I got attached to a team in Seattle. So I was like, I'm going to go to Seattle, free travel, visit my sister and work out of the office. And so I posted my tech talk, which was, um, um, let's see. Essentially it was like balloon animals and like making them, but in mathematical jargon, no, Parti- <laughs> uh, uh, manifold partitioning in three space. Um, which, which <laughs> but is, it really uh, was balloon animals. It really was balloon. And I made folks let know it's like, hey, it is balloon animals. And um, so I, I sent, sent you that teaser with some pictures. Feel free to put those somewhere if folks want to see them. Is that I is that then I would like demonstrate, like, no, here's a balloon inflating it, uh, bubbles, basic techniques. Um, I'd have some advanced things showing the different kinds of balloons. There's 160s and 260s and 360s and 421B bodies and, and, and blossoms and, and, and of like, no, a space alien with, with a helmet, the frog with the tongue that would go back, no, a flower that looked like, like, where's the balloon in this? It's like a solid, how did they do that kind of thing? And then I had like a couple garbage bags of, the partially inflated balloons and everybody got to make a threefold dog flying mouse and a regular balloon dog. So mayhem erupts during that time. Like everybody's like, Oh, squeaky, squeaky, pop, pop, squeaky, squeaky. It's like, I made one. So modern art and um, kinds of things. Um, And then most recently for a teaching, a combined part of the combined uh, technology for the advanced iOS course is that the memory management model is kind of strange of like you have this pipeline and then you've got the tail of it that you put in a set and somehow it magically cleans up but it's a whole lot like balloon bubbles so a bubble is a little twisted portion of the balloon and if it's not connected it will unravel but if you control the beginning and the end you have as many of those in the middle as you want so apple has one end of this balloon each of the stages of your combined pipeline is a bubble and you've got the other end so when you're done with it and you release your end everything is then going to unravel and your memory gets cleaned up. And so I actually had a balloon there to show that in action. And folks said that was a, you know, kind of like, oh, now I understand how this all cleans up after it's up. Really cool. We need to have you do this more at uh, at Cocoa Heads. (laughs) Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of inventory left. It kind of goes stale after after a while. We really should get into it. (laughs) Mark, it is always 100% a pleasure to have you on this show because it is always some incredibly in-depth knowledge with just a touch of chaos thrown in. (laughs) And it is always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for for taking time to join us this this season. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. You've got a great place to visit. You can find Mark online, as always, uh, at... Well, as long as Twitter remains at at Borkware, that's B O R K W A A W A R E. Uh, you'll you'll know that you've got Mark because you'll hear Bork 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 Bork, and you'll see a Bill the cat. Yes, um, I love that. I am on Twitter as Podcast Drew. Oh, there's the Bill the cat, and you'll see that in the video version. Susanna is online as Suz Gupta, S-U-Z-G-U-P-T-A. Next episode, Kadeco professional growth contributor Kaveh Balumbo is going to join us to talk about diversity and inclusion in tech. But that's going to wrap things up for this episode. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We'll be back again in two weeks. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the Kadeco Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget to leave a rating in your favorite podcast app. See you next time.